Welcome to Legally Speaking, a podcast from the Utah Attorney General's Office. Here, we will be discussing matters of policy and justice, cases that our office is taking on, hot topics in Utah and in the world, but of course, it will all be done <coughs> legally speaking. Hello, I'm Richard Pyatt from the Utah Attorney General's Office and welcome to Legally Speaking. I'm talking right now with Larry Echohawk, who is our Special Counsel for Indian Affairs for the office. Welcome, thank you very much for joining us, Larry. Thank you. We're gonna be talking about the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a very important bill that the office supports and that uh, obviously as the Special Counsel to Indian Affairs, Mr. Echohawk also um, supports. Would you mind telling us first, before we get into the ICWA, um, substantial stuff about ICWA, what your job is here at the Attorney General's office? Like, what does the Special Counsel for Indian Affairs mean? Well, I'm actually a Special Counsel and Advisor both to the uh, Attorney General and the Governor. And when they asked me to serve in this position, it was Gover Governor Herbert and Attorney General Reyes, and the message was that we've had um, challenges in our relationships with uh, Indian tribes and we think with your background you could help us to do better in improving those relationships so basically that's it there are a lot of different issues that I end up working on but the goal is to have a good sovereign to sovereign relationship between the tribes and the state so since you've been here you said four years or so yes how's it going have you recognized that that was a gap that uh, that you're filling adequately. Is there more work than you can handle? Would you say, or how? I think is it's it been it's been very successful. Uh, a lot of people, other than me, have said that the relations between the eight federally recognized tribes in Utah and the state government is as good as it's ever been. It's been improving steadily, and that's good news because mm -hmm. when when you don't have good relations, there's contention, there's lawsuits. Uh, we've had a history, uh, just as an example, on the, in the Uinta Basin, uh, 45 years of litigation, uh, seven federal suits, including a trip to the United States Supreme Court, cost millions of dollars, and uh, it creates division. Mm -hmm. So I think the the present thinking is establish good working relationships mm -hmm. and uh, this is better for all. Hey, that's great. That's a great idea. I'm, I'm, we're really happy that you're here. So the Indian Child Welfare Act is a, 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 this year at the legislature, House Bill 40, Yes, uh, is a, a pretty significant issue. Would you describe for us what, what the bill would do and what the Indian Child Welfare Act is or when it, how it came about? Well, it, it goes back to um, the advent of the Indian self-determination uh, policy change in, in uh, 1975. It was in the Nix administration where the United States uh, basically said, we've got to chart a new course because we've had uh, you know, bad relations between the United States and tribes. And one of the particular problems that they were having is uh, separating Indian children from their families right. and their communities through the boarding school process, mm -hmm. uh, but also in uh, court cases. Mm -hmm. So there were, were there, were there uh, how many children would you estimate over the course of history were removed from, uh, from their Native American homes and under the, under the guise, I would presume, that they could have like a better life if they went with a white family? Is that, was that kind of what was happening? That's what was happening. And I don't have a number, you know, but it's, nationwide. It's a lot. But just to give you an example, uh, if, the, if a situation occurs within the reservation, it's up to the tribal government to adjudicate that, to okay. make decisions. But the Indian Child Welfare Act addresses what happens when it's state. You know, they're in Salt Lake City sure. or in Provo, and they have a child welfare issue come up, and they have to make decisions in the court system. Uh, back in the days prior to the enactment of the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, about 35% of these cases were involving Indian children and family were happening in state courts, not tribal courts. Of those uh, cases that went into state court, 
the result was that 90% of the Indian children were ending up in non-Indian homes, not, mm -hmm. not with their family or extended family. And uh, the tribes were alarmed because we're losing our children. Right. So the United States Congress responded in 1978 to pass the Indian Child Welfare Act, which imposes federal standards and requires the states in their adjudication process uh, in family services to respect those standards. Right, and take that into account. Yes. So the, the situation today is that it's now before the United States Supreme Court. The Indian Child Welfare Act is being challenged. Uh, uh, the plaintiffs hoping that they can uh, get a knockout punch to do away with the act. Um, and the tribes are alarmed at that. Uh, it's before the U.S. Supreme Court. The tribes do very well in working with the Congress and uh, the executive branches of the United States government, but they don't do well in the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So the legislation that is before uh, here in, in Utah is to embed that those federal standards in state law. So it right. would be an act of state sovereignty okay. to, to adopt these uh, standards and it's been described uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act is the the gold standard you know it's working it's worked for 45 years mm -hmm. not without any problems but sure. when the problems have come up there seems to be an adjustment they've gone through some litigation but uh, the child welfare workers in Utah support it mm -hmm. they think this is a good idea and, and the governor, the supports, governor it, supports it. And our office supports it. Yes. And uh, now it's time for the legislature to decide whether they're in support. The eight federally recognized tribes in Utah are adamantly asking and supporting the, uh, this legislation that would embed those standards under state law. So Just in case the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, decides to... to declare parts of it or all of it illegal. So anything, my experience is that anything that has to do with children, the, uh, the well-being of children, what their future is, the families they're raised around is extremely uh, emotional and personal mm -hmm. to people. Oh, so if, um, if the Supreme Court uh, doesn't act in, in favor of what, the, you know, of upholding the you know, the 1978 law, then that could that could potentially damage, you know, the relationship that we've, uh, the, you know, the the governor's office and mm -hmm. the attorney general's office and other uh, other governmental en entities around the United States have built up with the with the tribes, and all that goodwill would would potentially be gone. Is it that significant of an issue to people? Would you say? Yes, it is. Um... You know, as I said, you know, my job is to work to improve those relations. But now you've got this legislation that has the potential, if they don't pass it, you know, to to be removing Indian children from their from their families right. and from their tribe, and uh, you know, the loss of their culture, and so that's what's at stake. The tribes feel very strongly. So if Utah fails to act, that's going to be of great concern to these eight federally recognized tribes. So, uh, from what I've observed, there's a lot of significant issues at the Utah legislature this year, but this is, stands to be one of them. Well, there's, there's been a lot of, I've noticed that, that uh, there's been a lot of people here uh, really rallying for it. You had a news conference mm -hmm. about it, several of the news organizations uh, picked up on it. I mean, it's gathering uh, gathering support. So mm -hmm. what's the fate of the bill right now? It's been tabled, which usually is not good. It's not good. Um, and we're working the legislators, but the problem we're running into is that some of the legislators say, well, let's wait and let the U.S. Supreme Court de you know, decide the case, and then if we need to do something later. Uh, the problem is that we've got like uh, just this morning, you know, the attorneys that work on these cases said as many as 300, maybe 400 uh, of these cases, you know, involving children in the queue. 
And so if the federal standards fall, then what do you have in place to protect it? It's not built into state law. Hmm. That's what this is all about. So we can surmise the emotional impact of this, but um, what the Supreme Court is presumably going to be deciding is the legal aspects of the law. And That's they're going right. to be deciding mm -hmm. that it's not appropriate to have this law nationwide. Right. What's your impression of what are, the, what are the legal arguments? It seems like if you're, if you're trying to keep uh, children with their, with their families and with their, with their culture, we're celebrating that right now. Mm -hmm. In society, we're, we're celebrating that. Mm -hmm. So what potential legal grounds could they, could they have that need to be uh, handled that w would cause them to rule uh, against that 1978 law? Well, there's some constitutional arguments that are being made. And uh, one of them is equal protection. That you've got the Indian Child Welfare Act that singles out uh, Indian children. And they say that's racial discrimination. Well, there's a long line of cases that said when you're dealing with tribes and, and their families and children, it's not racial. It's political. These are sovereign governments. And the United States for, you know, 200 years have passed laws, the Congress, you know, making special laws and rules for Native Americans. And, and they've said, the U.S. Supreme Court has said, that is not racial when we do that. We have a political relationship, so there's no violation of equal protection. Hmm. If, if the court, I, you know, I think if they said that somehow the equal protection clause would prevent this law from being constitutional, I'm thinking uh, Title 25 of the United States Code, which deals with Indians, might fall apart, mm -hmm. you know, because they've been doing that forever. And U.S. Supreme Court decisions have established this standard of it's not discrimination because these are political decisions made by the Congress. It's not racial. And the other thing is that uh, there's an attack that the federal government should not be telling the states what to do. Right. The, so this this impresses me as something that maybe House Bill 40, uh, mm -hmm. this could be a pole in the sand for us right. to say, we know you're going to decide this at some point, but here's where we are. Yeah. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. You're, you're going to be looking at a... You know, an issue there. Well, if it's the gold standard and if it's uh, blessing the lives of uh, Indian children and their families, uh, why doesn't Utah, which is known for family values, mm -hmm. protect these children? You know, because uh, when you say something is the gold standard, that means it's operating well. The attorneys that work on this for the state have said that to the legislators. This system is working. And so why are we going to try to, you know, not, right. not support it, not keep it in place? So, you know, as you start to read about it and, um, and talk about it with people, it seems like this is uh, about the welfare of children. And the issue is centering on children, their well-being, what's the best uh, course of action for them, but really, What's happening here with this legal action impresses me as something that's uh, protect, could be perceived as, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, are people perceiving this as something that's really trying to attack the culture that's, that, that's continuing uh, the history of this nation of trying to, uh, trying to affect you know, the well-being of the tribes, well, essentially. That, that's Are people taking it that way, I guess is my question. Well, uh, tribal people definitely feel that, you know, if, if the Indian Child Welfare Act falls, then the most important resource that they have, their children, are being attacked. That, and their culture, they're going to they're gonna lose something that is very precious to them. There's nothing more important really, than their future posterity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think they're asking the state of Utah, you know, help us. Mm -hmm. uh, At least show some, show some moral support. Yeah. If, it, if it has any kind of legal effect, that's one thing. Yeah. But at least support the tribes. Yeah, go on record that uh, right. we stand up for, 
you know, protecting Indian children to maintain their relationships with their families and their and their tribes. Okay. All right. Well, we're recording this in January of 2023, so we're in the middle of the process right now. If you're watching this sometime in the future, then you'll know what happens. <laughs> but we don't at this moment. But this is probably an issue that I imagine is not going to go away even after the legislature, depending on what they do. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we've got the Supreme Court action. Um, do you feel like this is something that you're going to continue to work on for as long as you're here with the office in some way or another? Well, I hope it gets settled here real soon. It'd be nice if the U.S. Supreme Court just came out and said, you know, this is in place uh, for good. You know, it is not unconstitutional. And it'd be especially nice if it was embedded under the sovereign authority of the Utah legislature, the laws of this state that uh, we recognize that this is what we need to do. I might mention that the state of Utah has already joined an amicus brief right. in support of maintaining the Indian Child Welfare Act. Right, and, and, and our Utah, office has written an op-ed that has uh, been published to, in support of it. Yeah, and 26 states you know, have done that along with Utah. So uh, these are states where they have large numbers of tribes and native people. The states that started the litigation, meaning Texas, Texas has got three tribes out of 574. Yeah. So we kind of look at that and think, uh, why didn't you, <laughs> why don't you pay attention to what the states that have large numbers of native people think about this. Yeah. They want this law to remain in place. Mm -hmm. And 10 states have already embedded the law into their state codes. Yeah. Well, it's really, it's a fascinating issue. If you, uh, if you look online about ICWA, there are these legal arguments we're, we're talking about, which are interesting in themselves, but there's also very compelling emotional stories of the impact over the course of history that this has had on children and, and families as well as the tribes. So, Can I give you a little emotion? Yes, sir. Uh, my grandfather was uh, taken from his family and sent to Pennsylvania, the Carlisle Indian Boarding School. He actually ran away from that experience and somehow made his way all the way back to Oklahoma. My father was taken at a very early age, about eight years old, to the Shilako Indian Boarding School. Dressed in a gray uniform, cut his hair, physically beat him if he spoke his language. Those are the kind of things that were happening because there's this thought that these Indian children are better off, you know, not in their family settings, right. you know, and that's why so many Native children have ended up not being connected with their tribes. Well, the policy that the Indian Child Welfare Act stands for is to uh, protect those uh, children and their family relationships. And the tribes are vitally you know, concerned because their future existence as a tribe right. is threatened. Yeah, that is personal. We appreciate you sharing that. We appreciate your expertise, and we're really glad you're here. Obviously, the office has taken a stand on this issue. We invite you to do your research and find out for yourself. But um, this is an issue that, as we mentioned, is not going to go away. So um, we'll be keeping an eye on it for you. All right. Well, that does it for us. For uh, Larry Echohawk, Rich Pyatt, thanks for joining Legally Speaking. We'll see you next time.